Hello and good afternoon, good morning. Greetings to everyone who's just joining us. Uh, while we're waiting for a few participants to jump on to the webinar, I just want to take a moment to introduce myself, introduce uh, our topic of discussion today, give you a bit of a flavor of what you'll be hearing over the next hour with us. Um, so thank you all for joining our webinar on clean energy jobs. I'm Rachel Doran. I'm the Director of Policy and Strategy at Clean Energy Canada. We are a program of Simon Fraser University's Center for Dialogue, and we work to accelerate Canada's transition to a clean and renewable energy. Over the past year, we've seen some major milestones in the clean energy transition. In January, Bloomberg announced that investment in the energy transition had broken the $1 trillion mark, for the first time clean energy matching total investment in fossil fuels. On the job side, in the past year, the IEA found for the first time that clean energy now employs over 50% of total energy workers. With Canada, the EU, the United States not only committed to net zero, but putting serious dollars into seizing the opportunities, the energy transition is now upon us. But amidst this rapid change, many Canadians have wondered about how this will impact their employment and economic prospects. So over the next hour and 15 minutes, we'll look at the opportunities and challenges in the context of this global shift. Our discussion today builds off of Clean Energy Canada's recent report, A Pivotal Moment. Clean Energy Canada and Navius Research modeled the job and economic benefits to Canada of a net zero 2050. Our report was clear. Canada will see 700,000 more energy jobs in 2050 than exist today if Canada and the world reach net zero with growth in clean energy jobs outpacing the decline in fossil fuels. So with this shift coming, we wanted to dig deeper today. We wanted to talk to experts in many of the fields that we modeled would experience exponential growth over the coming decades. What does the shift mean for their sectors and industries and how can we prepare to make sure that Canada and its workforce take best advantage? In terms of the plan for today, First, Stefan Power, our Manager of Technology and Economic Analysis here at Clean Energy Canada, will share some of the top line findings from our report. And then we're gonna move into a discussion with our three special guests. David Patterson, VP of Corporate Environmental Affairs for General Motors Canada, who is focused on the transition to the EV supply chain. Matt Whalen, Canadian Director of Government Relations for the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, representing workers in what will be a huge boom in the, in the electricity sector. And Jen Hancock, VP of Collaborative Construction at Chandos Construction, a company with an ambitious net zero commitment who's leading the way on green building and green construction. Following this discussion, we'll open the floor to all of you uh, for any questions you have for any of our panelists. Now, while everyone's continuing to plug in, I'm just gonna cover a bit of housekeeping. All participants will be muted throughout the webinar. So if you have any technical issues or questions, please ask them through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Our manager of reports and outreach, Carrie, will do her best to troubleshoot them for, her, for you. You may need to move your mouse down to be able to see the panel at the bottom and find the Q&A function. Now, feel free to ask a question at any time using that Q&A function. We won't be monitoring the chat, so you won't see that available to you today. We will be compiling your questions in the Q&A function and posing the, them to our panelists in the last 20 minutes of the webinar. We'd also encourage you to share highlights of the webinar on your favorite social media channel. We'll circulate a recording and a copy of the slides to all who registered. Please feel free to share widely. And finally, if you want to stay informed about all things clean energy, make sure you sign up to Clean Energy Canada's weekly newsletter, the Clean Energy Review. We'll circulate a link to sign up right after the webinar as well. Now, if you're just joining us, thank you again for participating in today's webinar. I'm Rachel Doran, Director of Policy and Strategy at Clean Energy Canada. I'll now turn things over to Stefan, our Manager of Technology and Economic Analysis, for a brief summary of our recent work and latest report. If you want to follow along in our report during Stefan's presentation, Carrie will try to post the link in the Q&A. Thanks so much, and I hope you enjoy. Thank you, Rachel. So in our most recent project, Clean Energy Canada modeled what will happen to jobs in the clean energy and fossil fuel sectors as the world shifts to net zero.
We've actually been exploring jobs in the clean energy sector for a number of years now, always based on economic modeling we commissioned from Navius Research. But our latest report is the first one that looks all the way to 2050. 2050 is the year by which Canada has committed to achieving net zero and the required uptake in clean technologies will need to have transformed our energy economy to enable this transition. Before we dive in, I want to briefly explain how we define clean energy. Jobs in this sector cut across a wide range of areas and regions in Canada. Essentially, the clean energy sector concerns all aspects that make up a net zero economy. It includes electric vehicles and their components, clean electricity supply and transmission, the construction of energy efficient buildings, carbon capture and storage solutions in heavy industry, bioenergy, clean hydrogen, and much more. So this is a broad definition. And we also define the fossil fuel sector broadly to make sure we're comparing apples to apples. For example, in the same way we include EV related jobs in the clean energy sector, we include jobs related to gasoline and diesel vehicles in the fossil fuel sector. Now let's take a look at the scenarios we modeled. First of all, all our scenarios assume the world achieves net zero emissions by 2050. The global reality is that over 90% of worldwide GDP is covered by net zero commitments. In our first scenario, that's our main scenario, Canada reaches net zero emissions in 2050 in the most cost efficient way. We also modeled a current policy scenario that assumes no additional policy action is taken after 2030. And our third scenario contemplates what would happen if a future government were to roll back some of our most impactful climate policies, specifically undoing Canada's carbon price, clean fuel regulations, and the 2030 emissions reduction plan. And these are the main takeaways from our work. First, Canada will see 700,000 more energy jobs in 2050 than we have today if countries achieve their stated climate goals of net zero. The key difference is that most energy jobs will be in clean energy rather than fossil fuel energy. Essentially, growth in clean energy jobs will outpace the decline in fossil fuel ones. Secondly, rolling back climate action will weaken the energy sector and lead to fewer overall jobs. That's because global demand for fossil fuels, including Canadian oil, is expected to decline strongly in a net zero future. This means that even if we walked back our climate efforts, Canada wouldn't be able to protect the oil sands from an inevitable global energy transition. And lastly, the clean energy sector is a diverse cross-Canada employer, and it represents a truly pan-Canadian opportunity. Alberta's clean energy sector in particular is set to grow by 10% per year out to a net zero 2050. That's the strongest growth any province or territory. In fact, there will be even more total energy jobs in the province than there are today with clean energy job growth outpacing fossil fuel losses. This could be jobs in renewables south of Calgary, which are set to grow 70% province-wide by mid-century, or carbon capture and storage for industry near Edmonton, with almost 40,000 of those jobs in Alberta by 2050. Canada-wide, in our net zero scenario, there will be almost 3 million clean energy jobs in 2050, with the sector's GDP contribution rising to over half a trillion dollars. The clean transportation industry is set to become the biggest clean energy sector, accounting for more than 60% of clean energy jobs by mid-century. And almost half a million people will be employed to supply clean energy in Canada in 2050. When we look at the energy sector as a whole, we see a decline of one and a half million jobs in the fossil fuel economy. 
But this decline is far exceeded by an increase of 2.2 million jobs in the clean energy sector. On balance, this means an overall increase of 700,000 energy jobs by 2050. We also wanted to see what would happen to jobs in the energy sector if we were to roll back some of our most major climate policies. And we found that doing so will not create a stronger energy sector. Instead, it would actually stifle growth in the clean energy sector to such an extent that there would be 100,000 fewer overall energy jobs in 2050. I'll close with some recommendations. First, we need to continue putting in place strong policies that rapidly drive forward Canada's clean energy transition. This means implementing Canada's 2030 emissions reduction plan, but governments at all levels must do more to ensure we achieve a net zero economy by 2050. Second, we need to prepare our workforce for the huge increase in clean energy jobs and the high skilled opportunities this new energy economy brings. Third, Canada needs to invest in these new industries like electric vehicle manufacturing, batteries, sustainable mining, hydrogen, clean electricity, and so on. And finally, we need to ensure that no one is left behind in this energy transition. While there's still time to make it a smooth transition, we need to empower workers and their communities so that Canada makes the most of this net zero opportunity. Now, this was a very quick overview, and there's a lot more information in our report, but I wanted to give you a sense of the enormous opportunities Canada has when it comes to the clean energy sector. So that's all from me. I'll now turn things back over to Rachel to kick off our panel. Thanks, Stefan. Uh, I'll invite our panelists to turn their cameras on now. Uh, Stefan will be joining us at the end, so if you have specific questions for Stefan about the Clean Energy Canada report, please do feel free to pop those into the Q&A as well. But now it's time to explore some of the topics uh, already alluded to with top experts in the field. So as I mentioned at the outset, today we're joined by David Patterson, Vice President of Corporate and Environmental Affairs at General Motors of Canada, Jen Hancock, Vice President of Collaborative Construction at Chandos Construction, and Matt Wayland. Canadian Director of Government Relations at the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. Thank you all so much for being here with us. We're looking forward to an exciting discussion. Uh, so again, welcome all to keep you know, popping comments and questions in at the bottom as they occur to you. But to kick us off, um, Jen, I'm gonna go to you first. I'll give everyone an opportunity, but just give us a sense about you know, what is your respective organizations doing to help workers transition to jobs in the clean economy? And if you can give us a little background about yourself and your organization, uh, I'll give you a few minutes to introduce yourselves. Great. Thanks, Rachel. Yeah, so my job as a, you know, it's not a necessarily obvious what a vice president of collaborative construction does, but under kind of my portfolio, I look at climate and impact on our business, um, lean efficiency, and then also collaborative project delivery. And although they're different, they're all very interconnected and actually uh, work well together. From an organizational standpoint, so Shandos, we're a commercial general contractor. We have seven offices across Canada with focus in Alberta, BC, and Ontario. Um, and one of the big things for us in terms of thinking about uh, helping workers transition to more of a clean economy and clean jobs, we, we're kind of doing that in a, in a couple of different ways, but one very sort of broad base. So a year and a half ago, we set a uh, commitment for net zero 2040. And when we looked at that commitment, um, it wasn't just the greenhouse gas emissions of our operations, so our offices and our job sites. We actually decided to include in that commitment the embodied carbon of the buildings we build. So basically what that means is that by 2040, we want to, every building we build will have net zero embodied carbon is the goal. So it's a pretty large goal. And just to clarify for everyone, if you're not familiar, embodied carbon is basically like the, the upfront carbon. So when you go purchase insulation from a hardware store, there's carbon that greenhouse gas emissions that took to build that insulation. What a lot of the, the building industries focused on up to now has been energy use in buildings. And so we're looking at the energy use that took to build the materials that go into those buildings. So 
what that means is that our people across the board need to get better at looking at embodied carbon and also then the, the greenhouse gas emissions of our operations. So we see sort of that, how we're helping from a transition standpoint, it's kind of across the board that everyone's going to have to be quite literate in carbon, greenhouse gas emissions, embodied carbon as we go forward. And I'll pause there, Rachel. Thanks, Jen. Maybe I'll go to you, David, next, just to give a, a different industry's perspective. Uh, can you give us a bit of a sense of yourself and General Motors and what you're doing to help workers transition in the clean energy shift? Sure, Rachel. Thank you. Yeah, um, about three years ago, uh, three or four years ago at General Motors, our CEO, Mary Barra, sort of drew a line in the sand and declared that we will have our entire fleet of all our new light duty vehicles, everything from small vehicles up to uh, pickup trucks be all battery electric. And uh, and so this really set us on an incredible path to uh, towards change, the biggest change since the auto sector left horses behind. And all our competitors are really on the same pathway, really. Uh, and this is all part of a broader geopolitical shift as we look at uh, putting all the tools together uh, and the value chain to make all that work. My job is, uh, as head of corporate affairs for General Motors Canada is to get up every morning and make sure that a lot of this takes place in Canada. So for the last three years, um, what uh, my focus has been uh, goes back, I'll go right back to the awful period where we saw the shutdown of the Oshawa plant, but then we saw it opened again. And we saw it opened uh, from a plant that was probably 90% male and older to a whole new 3,500 staff of people that were 50% women. That's probably the highest percentage of females in a manufacturing plant in North America. Um, so that, that we learned some things on that along the way. We also made uh, face masks for PPE uh, during uh, COVID when we weren't making cars and we learned um, how to be really flexible. Um, with that, we put a new test track in place for new electric vehicle software right at the same uh, location. And we grew our software business in Canada from about 150 people to 1,500 people now. Why is that important? Because a lot of batteries are going to need software and we want Canada to be a big part of that because of our incredible university systems and the people that we can bring into developing batteries going forward. And then with some of the learnings that we put in place, we converted our electric vehicle plant in Ingersoll to be Canada's first full electric vehicle manufacturing plant, making bright drop delivery vans, all battery electric. Um, and just today, um, oh, I, along the way too, we announced that we're converting our engine plant in St. Catharines to, uh, to make uh, electric drives. Um, and just today we're announcing actually, I think this hour with the Quebec government and with the federal government, um, the progress on a cathode active material plant in Bicancourt, Quebec, which will see an ability for the supply chain of vehicle of, uh, critical minerals to be processed in Canada for our electric vehicles going forward. So. All that to say the automakers are in a pretty complex, uh, deep supply chain, and a lot of this is taking place in Canada. There's a lot, a big range of jobs that sort of moves from the old days where people were sort of in, uh, you know, uh, mechanical or in civil engineering or in those types of, of jobs to now electrical and now chemical and now software. All those types of skills are becoming important in the auto sector. And the good news is that we have that basis here in Canada. And then in the factories, and we shouldn't just be looking at the factories alone, we have to uh, make sure that we reskill um, to a degree. We still you know, make cars with many of the same components when they're electric, but uh, a lot of focus on safety, on batteries, on uh, dealing with high voltage. Um, and so we still need all kinds of new tra training, whether it's a boiler maker or whether it's people in our dealerships or building charging networks across Canada, all these things require new investment and new skills. And it's a very deep supply chain. It's going to take a decade to get us through it. But uh, I think at the end of the day, General Motors probably be twice the size of what it was three years ago in Canada. Thanks, David. 
Uh, Matt, uh, last but of course not least, you're representing some of the workers, really key uh, players in this transition. Can you give us a bit of a sense about what you and your organization are doing and what you're seeing in the in the transition? Absolutely. Thank you, uh, Rachel. And um, as you mentioned, I am the Canadian Director of Government Relations for the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, or IBEW. Uh, I represent our members here in Canada. We have about uh, 775,000 members throughout our organization in North America and just approximately 70,000 here in Canada. Uh, prior to my role here, I'm actually a Red Seal licensed electrician and worked in, in uh, many facilities across the province of Ontario, including the Kami plant in Ingersoll that uh, was mentioned by David earlier. Um, I'm a board member of the Canadian Climate Institute and uh, earlier in my, a few years ago was appointed to the Government of Canada's Just Transition Task Force on Canadian coal power workers and, and communities. Our members represent um, work in a variety of sectors uh, right across the country, whether it's utilities, uh, electrical generation, transmission, construction, marine rail, manufacturing, and, and many more. Um, we are in every province and territory across the country. And we've taken an active and, and we hope leading role in the labor movement on just transition and sustainable jobs. And we do believe it does need to be worker centered. Um, but we need to have you know, a tripartite system. We have government and industry at the table so that we're we're all working together towards the same goals and, and not ones left behind. Um, like I said, we were working for an advocated or worker center approach. Um, and, and some of the work we're doing uh, right in the local area in the communities are right in our training centers. We have uh, IBW training centers right across the country that are funded by not only our members, but also our employer contractors. And these training centers ensure that we're training our members to be on the cutting edge of, of the newest skills coming out or making sure that we're keeping up with the demand from clients and from industry to make sure that we continue to be the go-to source uh, for highly skilled labor in this country. We have a lot more work to do. Uh, we've been doing some work, as David mentioned, within the GM plant in Oshawa. We haven't reached that goal yet of 50%, but we are working hard uh, to bring more women, more underrepresented groups, uh, indigenous people into the skilled trade, specifically the IBW. Um, to provide those better opportunities that we have and we're able to provide our members right across the country. So thank you. I'll pass it back to you, Rachel. Thanks so much for the introduction. Um, Jen, I may go back to you with this one, but maybe just to give us a bit of a sense of the challenge, first of all, um, what do you think the biggest challenge to the Canadian clean energy labor market is going to be out to 2050? And do you have any sense about what we might be able to do, do to overcome it in what you're seeing in the construction industry? Well, I was thinking about this question from a slightly different angle. And one in that, um, you know, if we kind of go back to the basics of the three R's, like reduce, reuse, recycle, from the construction industry standpoint, and we think about, you know, First of all, the construction industry is right now facing labor challenges across the board. Um, they're, they're not crunching us in most spaces. I mean, some businesses are definitely struggling to hire skilled labor. Um, I think it is going to increasingly get more and more difficult and we're going to see a, a real impact to our buildings coming up. Um, one of the biggest challenges is that if we want to a, when we think about energy anyways and clean energy use, one of the first things we can do is actually reduce the amount of energy we need and use. And that means we have all, uh, most of the buildings we have 80%, you know, when you think about going forward, most of our buildings are built. Um, we always continue to build new buildings and take some down, um, but retrofits. So we need to do retrofits to reduce energy use. And so um, one of the biggest challenges is just making you know it work to do retrofits in the first place, having the skilled labor to do that. Um, and so I actually think that that's going to be a piece in the labor part of that. And then I'm sure other you know we talk about um, one of the biggest pieces of doing a retrofit is starting to think about electrification. Um, that's a big issue in Alberta where I'm you know based out of, uh, in terms of you know you look at our electricity grid right now and it hasn't transitioned in a way that you know is is clean and it's going to need to. Um, so I think that's that's one of the biggest challenges we have. And uh, so uh, that connected to we have to do the reduce and reuse piece before we can get into that. Uh, that's that's the biggest part. And then I think the other thing I just want to note, and I am no expert in hydrogen, and I know someone had asked a question earlier, but I do think as we start to make this clean energy transition, we are in danger of having the conversation around hydrogen and the transition, especially, you know, Alberta's, you know, jumped on board this, especially that being a bit of a distraction to us having clean energy. You know, there are gonna be, when we start to think about the use of hydrogen, 
it's not all clear right now how that's going to transition us to a, you know, a greener path. And so I think we always are going to be in transition as we try to experiment and uh, figure out, you know, a new path forward. But the danger I see is that hydrogen actually doesn't get us to the place, you know, it, it, or it, it's maybe going to be part of the answer, but it's going to distract us significantly from doing all the things that we already know we need to do, which is reduce energy use in our buildings. We already have solar and wind that we can put into the mix. And so I think that is uh, something we have to contend with. Well, Matt, Jen's giving you a great opening here on the changes needed to the electricity grid. Do you want to chime in with a bit of your perspective on some of the challenges you're seeing there, particularly on the labor side? For sure. Um, you know, I think, I mean, she was absolutely correct. We have a, a challenge ahead of us and it's, it varies by region, whether she's talking about electricity, um, each, each region of the country has unique opportunities, but also challenges. Um, she mentioned some of the challenges in Alberta and for labor, it's, it's much the same. There are, there are some shortages in certain regions of certain trades. Um, and it, it really varies from area to area, region to region. Um, what I think we need to do is, is have an opportunity and go back to my tripartite piece, which you heard already in my openings piece, but I think that's an important part that when you, when industry and government work together, we're able to see those challenges, hopefully ahead, you know, and you can work together on what the, what those labor market challenges are going to be and help to create policies, both within industry, within labor and within government to try to try to entice people into those sectors, uh, what's ahead of what you're looking at ahead of time. I think that's a big piece on how do we overcome it. Um, but we need to do that work today. We can't wait till 2040 or 2045 or 2050. Um, we need to work on that today. Um, in terms of the electricity piece and reduce reuse that Jen had mentioned, you know, that is, that is true, but our grid is, we need to double the, or triple the size of our generation, but also the transmission. We have areas with rural and remote communities, not only in the North, but within right across this country that need to have clean, reliable electricity. And so we need to start from the foundation of the generation piece. Um, there are technologies out there that are, are still on the cusp, such as the hydrogen or such as uh, small molecule reactors, uh, but we need to continue to build, um, whether it's on a microgrid in, in certain areas or build larger uh, generation pieces that will be able to provide the backbone for clean electricity, reliable electricity right across this country. Um, and we need to have a good energy mix. I come from the province of Ontario. Um, and when they tried to remove that nanocoke plant a number of years ago, we had uh, advised the government that they were going to keep your brownouts. That, that wasn't, they didn't have enough base load electricity, even though they were starting to ramp up. And we don't want to see that happen in any other provinces. So I think it's a good example um, for other provinces to, to, to follow suit and say, okay, how do, what can we learn from that example? And can, can we ensure that before we take anything offline that we actually make sure that we have the base load electricity required to meet the demand now, but also, also going forward. Thanks, Matt. Uh, David, I'm going to turn to you, but in order to shift from the, the challenges also to the opportunities, I'd love to hear your perspective on both. What are you seeing out there as kind of the biggest challenge in the labor market up to 2050? And you already mentioned a few of the opportunities with General Motors Canada growth. Um, can you speak to both sides of that coin for us? Sure. Well, I mean, uh, for us in the auto sector, we are all highly integrated within a North American auto uh, world. And so, um, you know, we come now in this uh, uh, context of the massive Inflation Reduction Act, the infrastructure acts that have taken place in the United States. So as an investor in a lot of this, because ultimately at the end of the day, the, the factories and the infrastructure has to be paid by the private sector. And to be able to, to drive a lot of that investment, um, you look carefully at it. And as we, as we look at uh, building our infrastructure and all the components I mentioned before, there's really, they're building on what Matt said, there's not enough electricity, there's not enough land, there's not enough labor, and there's only so much money going around for a period of time to co-invest in a lot of these things. And so those four are the big factors that investors are looking in. You see a lot in the news right now about the the incentives and, and companies looking for those. But the other things are really important as well. And certainly availability of labor is something I'd put on the positive side in uh, the Canadian side of the ledger 
um, you know, building on what Matt said, uh, you know, when we converted our CAMI plant to an all electric uh, production facility for bright drop cargo vans, uh, we agreed with our union um, as we did it that we would make it, because uh, it's the first one in Canada, a learning experience along the way. What do we learn about electricity? What do we learn about safety? What do we learn about all this transition? Because there's new jobs in the factory. Um, there's going to be new jobs, though, all through the supply chain as well. And the auto companies are going to start doing at first some things that our suppliers did previously. Um, you know, we own our own battery chemistry, for instance, um, and we partner with uh, companies that uh, that build that battery supply chain. So we need to to understand the skills in a chemical plant, in a mine. We actually own mines now in the auto sector. General Motors is invested in mines as well. So we, we have to have a, an eye in on all those things. Uh, what gives me um, sort of some some encouragement when I look at these things uh, as to why Canada, um, you know, I think it's all that partnership that uh, that has been mentioned. That's really important, not just partnering with government, but partnering with our utilities, partnering with um, our unions, of course, are our, our, uh, helping our existing uh, workers. Uh, it was really nice to see an announcement of Ontario that they um, just last week that they will pay for the training for any auto worker in the supply chain. Um, that That's really encouraging. That's really smart in terms of trying to make sure that this looks like a good place to uh, to put that type of investment. Because, you know, if you're putting up a battery plant, you're going to need 4,000 workers. You need them in two years and you need them trained and you need them ready. So you're going to be working with your uh, your community colleges, you're going to be working with others, you're going to be working with your unions to do that training. So when the Ontario government steps up and says, this is one of the reasons that you're going to want to invest in Ontario and we'll help pay for some of that training, that's smart. That's something that goes on the ledger really nicely for the Canadian side of the border when we look at our future investments going forward. Thanks, David. Maybe I'll turn it to the positive now to you, Jen, as well. You already mentioned, you know, this kind of boon and retrofits and other pieces, which certainly factored into our own modeling. What are either the construction industry or particularly here in Canada, how are you seeing this as an opportunity? Well, I think it would be interesting, you know, one of the opportunities, so there's going to be some really great uh, jobs coming forth out of all the sectors as we sort of clean up and green the economy. Um, I think an opportunity for the country and and provinces, um, and I don't think, you know, I'm not an expert on carbon tax, but um, what if we could make sure that any of the carbon tax collected, not just, you know, didn't give the province kind of, I know we give, you know, rebates back to um, individuals, but what if we, and some, I think some small businesses, but what if we were actually able to point to, we collected X amount of carbon tax and that translated to X project that put in, you know, we, that we upgraded, started to help upgrade the grid in Alberta or wherever, or we we did put a solar farm in here, or or we had financing available for people to do retrofits at a low interest rate. So what if we could put really direct lines of um, between here's we're collecting carbon tax and here's the benefits that have come out of it. And we're basically turning that back into continual, like either clean energy or clean projects that really kind of translate so people can see that benefit. And I think right now that part is missing because provinces, I think, still can take that money and, and put it in a few different places. So I think something really direct there. And then I think, you know, maybe the other thing that could be a really interesting opportunity across the country when we talk about wanting to reduce our load in the first place um, and build, you know, greener buildings, because again, they're a huge part of the problem, a problem, just that it's a fact, like it's, you know, we've got buildings that, you know, suck up a bunch of the energy use and um, what if any pr new project or retrofit project, you know, if you could bump to the front of the line um, for permits, building permits, development permits, any of those things. So that's like just a, uh, if you're going to do something significant, we're going to bump you up. And maybe there's even a rebate on that building permit or development permit um, or rezoning of some, in some case. And so that could be huge incentive to get buildings and owners over that hump of trying to do the capital upgrade costs of building new, because there, there, there are our costs to building net zero or net zero ready buildings. We know that. And so those are the kinds of things that could make a huge difference. And so if you had a fund available that might help with some of those capital costs, and if you had 
incentives, carrots on the other side. I think they're two really incredible opportunities for the country across the board, both. And that, you know, you, you see crossover there. The problem is, is federal, provincial and municipal issues there. So easier said than done. But I think some really interesting opportunities. Thanks, Jen. Um, Matt, I'm going to ask for your perspective on opportunities, but I'd love to know, you mentioned in your introduction, you're involved in engagement on public policy on these issues and other pieces. I'd love to get a bit of a sense about how you're seeing this in your own industry create some opportunities, but even where you're already starting to see, you know, gaps emerge, places where, you know, workers might want to jump in and fill some of these opportunities. Um, can you give us a bit of a sense around, you know, what you think in a public policy positioning we need to be doing to capture some of these opportunities? I would love to, thank you. Um, I think there are a lot of opportunities in, in our organization. We have members that work um, in the oil and gas sector. We have members that work in the coal sector and talking to them, you know, right across the country, they're concerned about what this is going to look like and making sure that they have a good job. They're, they're proud of the work they do. Um, so going back, you know, but they also want to see, they want to be part of the change. They want to make sure that they're not left behind. And, and I think David had a great point and Jen as well, that they, they need that workforce. And in Stefan's um, uh, presentation earlier, this is a pan-Canadian opportunity. This isn't just region by region. This affects everyone right across the country, whether you're doing building retrofits, which are needed um, to reduce our, our carbon footprint, um, but it provides good quality skilled jobs in those areas. And there's buildings right across this country that need that retrofitting, making new build, building new buildings, new projects. Um, we have the opportunity to, like Jen had mentioned, maybe fast tracking permits in those areas to make sure that, that we can meet our climate goals. How do we work together um, right across the country to ensure that no one's left behind? I think Canada has an opportunity to be an example on the world stage of what this looks like and how to do it properly. And I, and I think we also have the unique opportunity um, around attracting investments. And David had talked about in his, his points earlier with the US and the, uh, and the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, Canada's budget recently tabled tried to match that best they could to make sure that investment stayed here. So folks like General Motors, um, people that were looking to invest in clean technologies or build plants or factories, we're going to look at Canada as well. And that's an opportunity for workers right across the country. Uh, there's examples in, in Ontario, in, in BC, um, out in Nova Scotia that we've seen, and they're gonna get, I'm missing a bunch, but there's there are opportunities to do that. And, and Canada need, needs to step up to the plate to show that we are a great place to invest, that we have the skilled workforce to do that. And that's what those private investments are looking to do. If government is able to set policy and looking at your question of policy, industrial policy that drives and provides stability for employers and for private investment sector, they're going to do that. And they need that stability before they make that investment. And when they do that, workers can benefit as well, as well as those communities that are the host and setting up shop for whether it's manufacturing, whether it's new buildings, uh, the mining sector. Uh, is also huge. We talked about uh, minerals earlier today uh, and David's point. Um, Jen talked about the opportunities of cleaner buildings and we can have a made in Canada solution instead of we've seen the supply chain through the pandemic where uh, coming out of that um, businesses are looking and, and, and countries are looking at how do we ensure they have energy security? How do they ensure that they have natural resources security? And we are very fortunate that we have all of those things, uh, opportunities in Canada. We just need to capitalize them on a way that that uh, helps the communities and helps workers and puts workers first. Great. Um, well, I think Jen, Matt, you both touched a little bit on this question of like, what's the role for government? What's the role for the private sector? Um, now I'm looking for a little storytelling. Uh, David, I'm wondering if you, you know, have any good stories to offer of innovative ways to support the transition, either things you've seen happen in, on the public side, things you think that companies or individual agencies are doing well. Um, you know, love to hear any great stories you have to share of optimism for us. Well, I, th I think the thing that gives me the most optimism, um, certainly in the electric vehicle uh, segment within North America, is uh, is what Matt just mentioned, and that's our our uh, 
resources in critical minerals and some specific critical minerals like nickel that we have an abundance of, but they don't in the United States. And as we start to try and build a sustainable supply chain here in North America for both climate change reasons, but also geopolitical reasons, we're going to need to build on that natural advantage and that codependency between ourselves and the United States is perhaps in my mind the most important economic thing that is on Canada's plate in a generation and uh, just to illustrate this um, because uh, it's it's not often understood that between the mine and the electric vehicle factory there's probably four or five factories that need to be built to process those critical minerals and so to take them, to turn them into a liquefied form, to turn them into a crystalline form, to turn them into a powder, um, and then have them uh, emerge into a battery factory and come into cells. These are new muscles for us. This is an industry that's been almost exclusively done in Asia with skills that uh, have been in places like Korea and, and others. And we're bringing those partners here with us um, and uh, really building a brand new industry. Uh, so no longer are we just sort of uh, drawers of water and hewers of wood. We're going to process here in Canada. And if we do that, that means jobs here in Canada, in all those four factories between every mine and, uh, and every uh, battery plant. Um, and there's going to be a lot of battery plants. You're going to need battery plants near all of the auto plants when we get to 2035, and they're all making electric vehicles. And there'll be hydrogen too. We've got a huge hydrogen division as well. If someone would just pop down a nice hydrogen refueling network right across Canada, we'd be doing it right now. Uh, but we're going to be spending a lot of our effort also making sure that we've got uh, level three charging across Canada and working with, uh, with all of our uh, different hydro companies to make sure that we do that coast to coast. So it's going to be a busy year, uh, 10 years ahead. It's going to take new skills but we've got what people need. And it starts with those mines. And if we can go fast enough and we can work in partnership between governments, with native groups, with um, our uh, unions and everyone to try and move the right strategic things first, then boy, the United States is gonna need us. Thanks, David. Um, so I promised I would give some time at the end for all of the questions that have been coming in in great velocity in the Q&A function here. So um, Stefan, I'll invite you to turn your camera back on in case any of these questions you want to chime in on or they're pointed directly to you. But I think, Matt, I might um, go to you first for a question. You know, we were going to talk to you a little bit about you know, what advice you might have for workers looking to engage in the clean economy. But I think in the Q&A function, someone's pointed out the challenge around particularly lower skilled workers, a number of you spoke to kind of increased efforts to have diversity in the workforce as part of the energy transition. Um, can you give us just any thoughts you have on how do we engage workers in the clean economy and how do we make sure that, you know, there is that something that's going to help um, not maybe promote uh, existing divisions in the workforce? For sure. It's a, I wish that we had like any think webinar, I think we all have wish we had more time to, to have these discussions. Um, I mean, there are an abundance of opportunities and I think it's about finding, finding that place and what, what, what's interests you. Um, there are programs out there that within our training centers, within uh, provincial governments and federal governments of bringing up, making sure those individuals meet the, get the skill set they require and maybe to get into a skilled trade, for instance. We have um, in, in different parts of the country, we have a pathways program uh, where we might help indigenous youth who maybe need their grade 12 math and science or, or just some, some additional courses and we will we'll help them get that in order to get their apprenticeship. Um, there are programs such as in Toronto, we have a, a, an IBW member who just started her career in the trade a few weeks ago um, and she never thought she would have a skilled trade and, and she came from a, a, a a lower income family and, and had struggles being a single parent. And now she's uh, well on her way after a, you know, a 12 week or no, sorry, 16 week work ready program that she is uh, working on a job site as of about uh, two weeks ago, I believe now, um, and started her career as an electrical apprentice and something that she's could never even dream of when we talked to her about it. 
Um, so there are those opportunities out there. And, and I think you, you folks need to really reach out and, and there's a lot of noise out there, but there is a lot of great information um, available. And, and there are help centers, uh, employee helps, worker help centers that can help guide you in the right direction. And certainly I could, you know, reach out if you're interested in the electrical industry, I'm going to, you know, give a plug to our organization, uh, but we can help point you in the right direction and, and give you the opportunities and skill sets you need. Um, back to David's point in, on some of the uh, charging stations. I mean, that is a huge piece for us um, in the IBW is we actually have right across the country, you need to be a licensed electrician to install these. But some of the work we do, we've, we provided a 20, 20 hour course on it's called electrical vehicle infrastructure training program to ensure that our members have the, the exact skill set they need to become specialized in that area um, to help provide contractors install these. As there has been some backlogs and, and our members are, are getting a lot of that work. Uh, but it's, it's as what David had said earlier, uh, there are opportunities out there. We're going to need the, those workers in every, every part of the econ economy right across the country. Jen, I didn't get to kind of go back to you with my question specifically on public policy, but one of the audience members is asking about the government's uh, sustainable jobs action plan used to be called just transition. Um, you know, what do you really need to see from Canada to make this successful? And I'm wondering if you'd like to add anything to your previous comments on, you know, what can governments at all levels be doing to help you prepare workers um, and make sure those uh, openings we see coming are going to be filled in your sector? Yeah, I think, um, to be honest, I think all levels of government, if uh, so, I, I think really to reiterate, I, I do think even on the dress transition, if we made it so that every bit of carbon tax collected had to go right back into showing like either clean energy creation, like basically adding additionality into the system or some kind of reduction of use in the first place, I think direct one to one and then communications of that would be huge. And if that became part of both um, you know, as the provincial governments collected that and then put that back into programs, it would be an incredible story, I think, and we would see some really great examples. Um, just a couple other things I noted, the other thing that the government could do, and someone else had asked a question about jobs and, um, you know, sort of helping people who might be less skilled or having trouble uh, in the first place, like uh, at risk of not having long-term employment. I think the other thing the government, I think, is doing, and but we could slightly increase, and we're seeing this across the board, is some, you know, uh, encouragement towards social procurement. And I think when we do, um, one thing I would like to point out as we deal with all of these like gnarly problems around elect electrification, green building, all of this stuff that we're kind of on the, constantly on the bleeding edge of what do we do and how do we make all this stuff work? Um, uh, as my title suggests, like I'm a big fan of collaborative project delivery. I think when the only way for us to solve all this is to to be able to like work together and to be into systems and, and contracts, especially on the, the the building side, that we can work together and try solve from a design and construction standpoint together in like the best way possible. We can include social procurement and we've seen really great examples where we've been able to hire and work with there's great organizations across the country like Embers in Vancouver and building up in Toronto women building futures in Alberta that are doing incredible work. Let's partner with those organizations. Let's help solve some of our labor problem in the design and construction industry by working with those organizations. All, all, construction jobs now have to all be clean jobs. Like we all have a climate job now. So that's what we have to transition to. Work with those organizations to hire people who may be at risk or underemployed. And we can do that and then train them and upskill them. And so I think that can be put in and the government can help with that with some social procurement rules. And if we're doing collaborative project delivery, it helps us execute on that even better. I'm going to quote you on that one, Jen. We all have a climate job now. Um, there's been another question in from the audience really interested in this kind of interaction between the US and Canada and David I know this has been a real area of focus for you so I might go to you first on this one. Um, I think that the person posing the question was noting that the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act in the US is posing a lot of opportunities, but many risks. And how do we maintain an advantage over the US and other competitors while being mindful of how we allocate our financial resources? Well, I mean, first thing, Canada is the luckiest country on the planet 
to be right next door to the United States and to have 100 years of, well, since the 1960s, let's say, of full integration with the U.S. auto sector. Um, and so you could not be luckier than Canada. There is money in the uh, U.S. Defense Department and others that Canadian companies are allowed to apply for. Um, and take advantage of. And as, we, as we've as we seen recently, our governments are uh, struggling financially to, to uh, keep up with the extraordinary incentives that are being offered uh, for production incentives for batteries and the like. But the IRA covers a lot more, and so does the Infrastructure Act, in helping to uh, advance the United States on putting that electric charging network that's going to be needed. You know, keep in mind, we're only, what, at 7% or something like that of all the vehicles sold each year are electric. Wait until they're 100%. And we see the shifts that are going to take place with major automakers all um, coming into this area. We're going to need to accelerate in these areas. And so Canada has got, as I think, its, it's uh, set of advantages uh, the IRA is a 10-year exercise. Uh, the incentives will run out in 10 years. Uh, that's a big transition time, so uh, we're going to have to pick our areas of strength. Some of what the IRA covers, for example, is things like the um, the, the building of that value chain um, for uh, the, the battery, not just the battery plants, but all those other plants I mentioned that will support those battery plants. You can't have a battery plant uh, unless you've got a cathode active material plant, unless you've got anodes, unless you've got nickel, unless you've got lithium, you need all of those things. And so Canada needs to pick the areas where we can win for the long term, not just 10 years, but 20, 50 years into the future. Things like R&D, Who's going to do all the battery recycling? In 10 years, all these electric vehicles will start coming off the road at last, and then we can take the batteries out, and there's companies like Lithion that we're investing in that can take that uh, that black mass and turn it back into the factories so that we don't have to mine as much. Canada should be the leader in the world in that. That's an area that's very predictable. It's going to happen in 10 years. Why aren't we leading in that? Let's do that. Um, in software, you, th you know, the thing that makes an electric vehicle go further is software to manage the temperature of the battery. Batteries like to be like people, 21 degrees. And in hot days and cold days, you need software to do it. Guess what we've got in Canada? Incredible software people. We can lead in that area. So there's tons of opportunity for Canada, but you can't do it all. Just be thankful you're next to the United States and pick your niches. And I think it goes from critical minerals to software and you'll do really, really well. Thanks, David. Now I know it's hard to participate in anything over the clean energy transition in the course of the past year without someone uh, talking about the IRA. So I want to give Jen and Matt a chance to weigh in if either of you wanted to add anything on how you're seeing um, investments and approach in the U.S. kind of impacting Canada and our competitive advantage. Sure, I can jump in. Sure. Uh, on the, you asked a question about the policy piece before, and I think the, uh, I mean, I couldn't agree more with David's point. We are very fortunate in Canada to be uh, a neighbor to the U.S. Uh, we have a very integrated supply chain, um, but we do have to compete with them as well. And so that that IRA really, I think, posed a challenge for um, government, for industry, not only the federal government, but provincial governments across the country and, and industry on what was that going, what does that look going going forward? Um, and how do we ensure that, as, as David mentioned, I don't want to keep quoting David and Jen throughout this, but I, I certainly agree with a lot of their points. Um, how do we ensure that these are jobs that are going to be around for a long time, that when they set up shop here in Canada, they make that investment, that the governments maybe make that investment or incentivize, that they're, they're set up and, and, and those communities will benefit and those workers will benefit um, for a generation. And I think we do have that opportunity. Uh, we have to just, we have to take that leap. We have to take it on. Um, in a in a responsible manner, but I think we have to act act now. Um, the clock is ticking. We have we need to make those changes, and we have an opportunity to become a leader. And we talked today a lot about the um, you know changing industries, future industries. But I mean, one thing I wanted to talk about and mention was traditional industries, fertilizer, steel, and cement. We have an opportunity to make those a, those are carbon heavy industries. We still need them. There's a world demand to need them, and I think Canada has an opportunity to. If we are able to make those a cleaner product, uh, I think the way on the international market is going to go, those are going to be green steel, better fertilizer, and better cement, and they're going to come to Canada to look for that. So even in those traditional carbon-heavy industries, I think we have a real opportunity um, for, for positive change. 
and aluminum. Yeah, I was going to say uh, thank you for the pitch, Matt, because we actually have brand new white papers out on our website that we just put together on Canada's competitive advantage on heavy industry and the chemical and fertilizer sector. So feel free to take a look at our website if you want to know any more details. And maybe um, just before closing off the IRA, I'd go to either Stefan or Jen if either of you wanted to add anything on our um, our neighbors to the south. Happy to to add. Um, yeah, I would definitely echo what David and Matt uh, said. I think, first of all, we need to realize that the difference in the size of the U.S. and Canadian economies means that it's basically impossible to match uh, U.S. incentives dollar for dollar, but it's not necessary because um, Canada can leverage its existing strengths. So we need to just be strategic. So that means focusing on clean electricity and the industries that benefit the most from our clean grid metal and mineral resources, uh, our highly trained workforce in tech, uh, manufacturing, mining. Uh, and besides just incentives, we also need to remind ourselves that Canada has a lot, a lot of smart policies in place already and more in development to help drive forward that clean energy transition and build a stronger, more competitive energy sector. Um, hot off the presses here, Matt, there's a couple of very practical questions pointed to you. Um, there is someone who is looking for advice very specifically on contract workers and coal plants, Where who can they connect with to assist them in their career transition options in Nova Scotia, and then a maybe a bit more general question around um, you know, you mentioned a allowing your members to specialize in installing EV infrastructure. So wondering whether, you know, workers really need another specialization or generally just to add sort of new skills to, you know, what they already have. If you have any practical advice for folks out there looking for those things, uh, I think they would really welcome it. For sure. I think I'll take the, uh, the EV question, the, the specialized question first. I want to make sure I'm clear that you know, we're not looking to break down the trade into subsets, but we're actually adding to it. So, uh, you know, in addition to become a licensed electrician, you want to maybe specialize in a certain area. And a lot of our folks do that. Um, contractors um, will look for maybe someone who's a fire alarm certification in the province of Ontario. So they're specialized in life safety equipment. So it's not a breakdown of the trade, but actually in addition to become more employable and you're, you're getting those up, up skills that employers and contractors will need in order to succeed. Um, so I think that's just something we offer and I just wanna make sure I'm, I'm clear on that, but thank you for the question. And the other one on the uh, advice for workers, specifically contract workers in coal plants, and, and this one was for Nova Scotia, uh, but outside of that, certainly there are um, uh, in, in the coal plants in Alberta, Saskatchewan, New, New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, there are uh, transition centers. Um, some of them are up and running, some are um, loosely running right now that are helping workers, not only in the unionized sector, but contract workers as well, that can be impacted by that transition. And they can even reach out to the, um, uh, the IBW. Uh, I, we're gonna throw that out there again. Uh, we have transition committees at our, at our local unions in those coal plants that are standing up for all workers, not just the ones in the unionized sector, just our members. It's an industry piece that uh, we are advocating for. So I encourage that individual to, to do that. It's um, in Nova Scotia, or they can reach out to me and I can give them more information offline. Thanks, Matt. And we're almost out of time here, but I'm just going to turn to Jen first and then David uh, for 30 seconds on any final thoughts to workers or on the transition overall that you want to share with our audience. I think for me, I could say that I think um, if private industry, if we take the approach that we all need to hit these targets, it basically back to that comment of we all have a climate job. If our companies can umbrella the work that they do with that as a prime goal, I think what happens is as workers, when they come into companies, they start learning and we have to do internal training and all of those pieces, but suddenly everyone climate becomes part of everyone's job. And that, you know, from a private sector standpoint, that's one of the biggest things that like industry can do um, to take charge and then help their employees really move in that direction. It's there is no question that we all need to move in this direction. Um, and that as we go from job to job, as people switch and we have to be agile and aware of that. And as we have, you know, the next gen of kids coming into work, that's going to be a core part of how we attract and retain and, and um, keep people engaged in their work. And so for private industry, that is a must. Um, you must do that. You must make all, you know, not, not only, and even if you're someone who doesn't believe, although I'm sure everyone on this call is a believer in climate, 
change and what's happening right now, the fact is that in order to stay competitive internationally, we all need to be moving in this direction, whether you believe in it or not, that is just going to be a fact. So whichever way you want to take, whether it's both, um, we all need to take that responsibility. All right, David, 30 seconds of closing uh, remarks here. I love Jen's comment. We all have climate jobs and, you know, it uh, doesn't have to be in a factory. It can be installing EV charging stations. It can be working in dealers. Those are going to be everywhere in Canada, coast to coast to coast. And, uh, you know, there'll be lots of new factories and there'll be um, change. And so I think the main thing is, it, it, let's all realize it's going to be meaning change in the things that we learn, the things we do. And if we can just have the mindset of, wow, what a great opportunity, uh, we can be leaders. What a great way to end it. And with that, it is two o'clock. And thank you so much for joining us, our panelists. It was a really excellent discussion. Um, I'll just remind everyone who's listening, there's an email coming with the recording, a PDF of the presentation, and a short survey that we would welcome your feedback on. Um, and please do feel free to share highlights from the discussion today. And we really are grateful for you to join us. Take care and have a great rest of your day, everyone.